has only become the only measure of success. Please welcome Anne. Tonight, um, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and um, pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, at some point, I'll work this out because my bit should be down here. Yep. I need to close that one and open up the um, just a bit down yep. there. Um, so, the title of my speech is The Long Con Has Money Become the Only Measure of Success? Our common sense tells us that if humans used money as the only measure of success, sorry, am I talking too loud? Sure. No, 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 okay. 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 It's just, here yeah, we go, that's fine. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, so our common sense tells us that if humans used money as the only measure of success, then it would be a stupid thing to do. Um, humans have complex needs and not everything, in fact not many things, should uh, or can be equated with money. Yet more recently, we have stopped questioning politicians and the media when they determine that something is working or not working because of the amount of money it generates or loses. The reality of what success is for a human being has now been distorted so that we even judge public services by how much money they cost. Without recognising that public services are the basis of a civilised society, premised on what society needs rather than what it costs. So have we been the victims of a con job? If so, how has this happened? According to Wikipedia, that reliable source, uh, a con is an attempt to defraud a person or group after first gaining their confidence. Con being the shortened word of confidence. A con exploits certain characteristics of the human psyche, such as trust. A short con is a fast swindle, which takes just minutes. A long con is a scam that unfolds over time and involves a, scheme, uh, a team of swindlers, uh, as well as props, sets, extras, and most importantly, scripted lines. The basis for my talk this evening is, as a society, have we been purposely fooled by confidence tricksters over a period of time into thinking that money is the only real measure of success? I'm sure many of you would be thinking, no, that's not how I would judge uh, success. So if I asked you, um, what would people say? How, how do they judge success in their lives? Does anyone have anything? To throw that at me. Oh, joy and happiness. Yes, joy and happiness. Self-fulfillment. Self-fulfillment, yes. <laughs> Feeling contented. Quality of our relationships. Relationships, so family. An active life. Yep. Having a good legacy. What a wonderful... <laughs> That's fabulous. Gosh, <laughs> that's good. Um, true legacy. So that's um, they're they're pretty reasonable things. They're the sorts of things most of us would think about. And uh, for me, that's I, I suppose family. That's some of my grandchildren. So um, uh, yes, that's uh, 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 the way I would uh, measure it. Um, and for other people, it might be things like health. So, the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The 2007 National Survey of Mental Health said that in New South Wales, in the 12 months prior to the survey, 25% of people surveyed had a mental health disorder. That's pretty significant. That's 2007. I can't see that it's gone down. I think it's probably increased. 14.4% of them had an anxiety disorder. This doesn't look like success to me in a state where we have a AAA credit rating and unemployment is relatively low. So if most of us don't actually believe it, 
then how has money become such a universally accepted indicator of success so that it overrides uh, all other reasonable indicators? I suppose once we stopped hunter-gathering and then later in our evolution lived in small villages providing for ourselves and growing our own food, we probably needed money um, uh, for shelter and, and uh, provisions, so that makes sense. But what happens when we have adequate money for all our basic needs? Um, wouldn't the measure of success be things other than money? But somehow in our first world privileged country, many of us who have plenty, and I include myself in that, uh, still strive for more. Even though we know that studies have shown that people earning over a moderate income have no additional increase in happiness, which is one of the indicators people talked about, or satisfaction with their lives. So when we go back to the first Australians, and I've just been for a recent trip to Kakadu and uh, took that photo, but um, it also uh, reminded me I, I worked in the late 70s as a nurse in Arnhem Land. And if at that time, uh, uh, working with people who were living a traditional lifestyle, you really got a sense of um, uh, the fact that you can function perfectly well uh, without money uh, if things are in balance and if you know what you're doing. So it, it um, just uh, it was of interest to me. Um, my technical skills aren't terrific. <laughs> so that's in Catherine Gorge, also on the trip, and that was quite lovely. So for a lot of people, it, it, you know, having a, a, a good environment um, is an important part of um, I'm sure people have seen it. Have people seen that movie? So some people have seen it, but some people haven't. Um, for those who haven't, it takes you back to the reason for the creation of the first corporations. Corporations were originally chartered associations for a specific purpose. They couldn't own another corporation. The first corporations were created as not-for-profit entities. They had to have a specific purpose for the public good. Gosh, those are the days. Yeah. Um, they had constitutions detailing their duties. And these constitutions were overseen by the government. Corporations as we know them today, which is a whole different story, came to Britain in 1844, when a new act allowed them to define their own purpose. So they went from having to have a particular purpose for the public good to being allowed to define their own purpose in the UK. The power to control them passed from the government to the courts. In America, in 1886, a landmark decision in the US court called Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific Railroad also heralded a major change uh, for corporations when it recognised the corporation as a natural person under the law. This is quite a bizarre thing uh, for a corporation which we know has as its only um, uh, focus uh, maximising profit. So, this has happened under the 14th Amendment to the American Constitution, which says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Now, this was originally uh, adopted, the 14th Amendment, to protect emancipated slaves. Um, but as a result of this landmark decision, it was soon used to defend corporations, and they took absolute control of it. And if you look back at the number of court cases, I think, you know, one ended up being uh, to protect a black person and huge numbers ended up um, uh, being to expand uh, the rights of corporations. <coughs> Once a corporation was deemed to have the rights of a natural person, language started to change and human needs became confused with a corporation's needs. In the US, by the late 19th century, there were many monopolies and cartels and massive labour unrest was brewing. The government responded by bringing in antitrust laws to break monopolies, and taxation and tariffs were raised. But it, it, it didn't really have a huge impact, even though state regulations started to creep back in. And it wasn't until the Great Depression 
uh, and then World War II, which saw the creation of welfare states in Europe, um, that the return of state intervention occurred in terms of corporations. So things were looking okay there for a little while. Um, however, in the 1970s, the Chicago School of Economists developed ultra-free market ideas based on deregulation and privatisation that <coughs> harked back to the laissez-faire capitalism of the 19th century, hence the term neoliberalism. In the 1980s, the political resources of corporate America mobilised to gain control of the political agenda. Thatcher and Reagan and quite interestingly, uh, Pinochet in uh, Chile, uh, using the Chicago school ideas, dismantled social contract through tax cuts, rolling back social welfare, and increasing privatisation. This is where we are now in New South Wales under this neoliberal government. Former Griner Cabinet Secretary Gary Sturgis is now back in Australia after 10 years in the UK at the Circo Institute. Oh. Heard of the Circo Institute? Yes. 10 years. Yes, that's the same multinational Circo whose focus is on privatising public services around the world. Um, I was reading in uh, the uh, Herald in about May, uh, one of the business writers there who I must follow up with, um, talked about the fact that um, uh, Circo's financial statement uh, for the end of the financial year was absolutely lacking and there appeared to be something seriously amiss. It was quite a long article. I think his surname is West. So I must go back and uh, have a look. The, yeah, uh, might have been, yes. Um, so people are picking up on little things going on, but not, I, I, I don't think, seeing the full picture. So we've got Gary Sturgis, you know, Sturgis back in New South Wales now advising this state government. So recently he authored a New South Wales Business Council discussion paper titled Diversity and Contestability in the Public Service Economy. Not the public service, in the public service economy. And you'll hear more about that word contestability because that's where uh, uh, public services, it's similar to what happened with TAFE uh, in Victoria, where um, they have to compete against private uh, uh, set, uh, sector or non-government sector providers. It's had really negative impacts uh, on TAFE in Victoria, but because we don't evaluate anything before we pick up on it and implement it, no doubt that will be coming you know, to a TAFE near you soon and to, unfortunately, potentially lots of other uh, public services. So, this paper, Diversity and Contestability in the Public Service Economy, uh, sets out the government's goal to transfer employment to organisations other than government. At the same time, we've got the for former Howard Government Secretary uh, of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Professor Peter Shergold, uh, working closely with the New South Wales Government, also on moving public services to the non-government sector. Uh, Professor Shergold, who is the chair of the New South Wales Public Service Commission. So this is the uh, commission that was created under the O'Farrell government um, to you know, professionalise the New South Wales Public Service. So we've got Professor Shergold uh, is the chair of that group. Um, so he's also, if you look him up, been the driving force in Western Australia for the strong push for disability services to be moved away from government by promoting this move as an opportunity for choice by consumers. It's interesting to note that Professor Shergold has also just been announced as one of the three people who will supposedly independently cost Tony Abbott's promises prior to the federal election. For those of you who are unaware, in the UK, approximately 60,000 public servants have lost their jobs uh, as public services have been privatised, many to circo companies, uh, since the Cameron government came to power, since 2010, so it's happened very quickly. 
This has been done under the Cameron government's banner of the term big society, i.e. small government, big society. So remember back to the definition I gave at the beginning of this talk for a long con. Part of the requirement for the long con to succeed is the use of scripted lines. Lines such as big society, small government, more choice, public service mutuals are all part of the scripted lines being used as part of the con to move public sector assets and services to the private sector. It is thought bubbles as opposed to a well-researched and transparent plan that we're seeing at the moment in New South Wales. But it's as if nobody's noticed the Emperor's got no clothes on. It also aims to change the focus of public services from social obligation to profit or constant increases in productivity. In my view, and I don't think I get much argument from this audience, um, these are opposing notions and in the long term will contribute to a destabilised society where only those who can pay are able to access the basic services that the people of New South Wales rightly expect. Recently, the New South Wales government has been trying to change the focus away from privatisation because they've picked up on the fact that maybe people don't like big business. I don't know, perhaps it's that $7.8 billion um, uh, profit that the Commonwealth Bank's made up till June of this year. But, you know, they don't seem to be too impressed with the, the uh, you know, big business. So now we're moving more, to, you know, to that much softer group, the not-for-profit sector. So they're trying to talk about uh, uh, moving it so that we've got more choice and devolving responsibility to the not-for-profit sector. If the move to devolve res responsibility for public services from the government to the private not-for-profit sector is a reasonable proposal, then why haven't we seen a plan? Why don't the people of New South Wales know about this? Why haven't we debated which services we think should be moved? Um, how we'll determine whether uh, those services, once moved, are providing uh, uh, value for money, if that's the only uh, uh, thing that we're going to accommodate. Even if, that, even if we take it back to money, all these proposals are very short term. They're not costed. We know in the UK that 9 out of 10 of the not-for-profits are now saying they feel under financial risk. That's because they've taken on uh, roles that they no longer feel they have the capacity to deliver. And for the not-for-profits that are currently dealing, particularly in the disability sector at the moment, um, the reason they manage with the small amount of money that the government gives them is that they can hand back the complex cases. They know that there's a fallback position. They can give them back to the government, and that's what happens. So that measuring uh, the outcomes from a not-for-profit who's delivering uh, a particular service, uh, and measuring uh, the, the same outcomes for the government who's uh, delivering the same service, isn't always apples with apples. You need to account for the fact that the really tough ones come back to the government. So where is this, the plan to support this ideology of privatisation? And where is the evaluation of this approach in other parts of the world? So at the same time as the government, uh, we know that there are significant questions about fraud are uh, currently coming to light uh, in the UK. Uh, Serco, for uh, example, in uh, July, uh, uh, they're looking in the UK at a $50 million fraud because some of the prisoners uh, in the privatised jails who uh, had then been released and who they were supposed to be monitoring turned out to have been dead for a lot of years. So there's things coming up now that they had these uh, contracts for a while that should be being picked up on by the New South Wales government. Mm -hmm. And we should be provided with that information before further decisions are made. In a recent survey in the UK, 
10% of people said that they, uh, they no longer believe that big society, uh, sorry, less than 10% of people said that they felt big society was going to deliver on its aims. So even there, things are starting to be questioned. In New South Wales, raising the alarm about the massive changes that are quietly taking place has been very difficult. And I'm talking about the changes to our public services. This is partly because public servants, instead of being treated as an asset to the state, have been demonised by this government, their employer. Now this may sound a little bit extreme, but the fact is that when workers in a car plant lose their jobs, it's a disaster. When 15,000 public servants uh, who are currently losing their jobs uh, uh, try and get some attention, it's almost celebrated by the tabloid media. Now this hasn't happened by accident. Why uh, are public sector workers seen as a group who we don't need? Somehow or other, the messages have all gotten mixed up and we haven't been able, uh, perhaps as a union, uh, perhaps as individual public servants, to explain what it is we do. And that's going to be part of the challenge uh, for me as a recently elected General Secretary of the Public Service Union. Actually explaining what it is public servants do and what will happen if they stop doing it. So, because public sector workers, public servants, not talking nurses, not talking people in uniforms where they can see what they do, but public servants, uh, the people who create the policy, who do the procurement, who do the um, uh, support of uh, staff yeah, who may be seen more, more often by the public, um, because what they have to say about the loss of services doesn't appear to be getting any traction uh, in the media. It's really difficult for them. At the same time, the government has also rushed through new legislation about how public servants will be employed, thereby trying to put the final nail in the coffin for public servants who believe in providing frank and fearless advice. So most of you would be aware that a, um, a bill was rushed through Parliament a matter of weeks ago, um, hurriedly went through the upper house. Um, the Greens and Labor uh, valiantly tried to stop it in the upper house and have it referred to a committee so that there could be some questions asked, um, but were unsuccessful in that because of the, um, uh, the dominance of the uh, uh, coalition and Shooters and Fishers and the Christian Democrats. So a really good reason to, uh, if you weren't planning to, to make sure that no government gets that level of control, whether it's in the Senate or uh, in the upper house. Um, so they tried valiantly but were unable to stop it. But what that means is uh, contracts uh, which senior public servants are on, these are appalling contracts originally introduced by Bob Carr, um, uh, in fact, we used to refer to the clause that they put in as the bob car off with your heads, head clause. Um, but now has been made even worse. So these are contracts where you can be sacked for any or no reason. There is no avenue of appeal. Um, and uh, that's now being extended under this Government Sector Employment Bill, initially to a further 2,000 public servants. So these are middle management, technical, uh, uh, public servants and um, so that's just the start. This bill would allow that to go all the way down. Now when you're under a contract like that, despite you know perhaps feeling quite valiant, it, and if you've got a, a mortgage, um, if you've got people relying on your income, you really are quite reluctant to say too much. So we've got this happening at the same uh, time as we've got this, this ideology and all these people beautifully placed, whether it's um, Shergold federally and at the state level, whether it's Sturgis, whether it's Western Australia, whether it's Victoria, it, it's happening. So it sounds a bit grim, but um, I think there's hope. Uh, the important thing is that we recognise what's going on here and that we try and get the message out. And in finishing, 
I would just like to say that I think a long con has been perpetrated, but that, there, that we are starting to see through it. I see the role of the Public Service Association of New South Wales and unions in general as being crucial in overcoming the bias of the media uh, towards big business, in articulating what the consequences will be if we allow money to become the only measure of success. And I'd just like to um, put up a couple of other photos to finish up. So that's just another one that uh, uh, appealed to me in the uh, Northern Territory, the Fog Dam for anyone. <coughs> that, that one amused me because um, I was with my teenage daughters, we were at the Mindal Markets near Darwin, and that's Mindal Beach. And uh, we walked out and there's all the people sitting there. <laughs> and my girl said, oh, there must be something happening. I said, no, no, they're just sitting there. And uh, they went, no, no, there's got to be something happening. Well, no, there wasn't. They were just sitting there because that's what you do in the Northern Territory. You enjoy the environment and you just watch. And uh, just as the um, last one, in terms of, uh, I thought it was interesting, an old $1 bill. Talk about an insult. Uh, there it is, the traditional owners uh, who've had such respect for the environment who have such wisdom to, to hand down to us. And uh, there it is on a $1 bill. Thank you very much.